Section eight of A Flurry in Diamonds by Amos Chiptree. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tom Penn. Chapter eleven. Just before you left here this afternoon, you will remember that, at the officer's request, I went up and opened the safe to satisfy him that the person who stole the diamonds had not secreted them there, and then locked them in, so that neither he nor she, nor anybody excepting myself, could ever get them again. It struck me as so ridiculous that I could not restrain the remark I made upon going up of how funny it would be if I should find them there. Of course I did not find them, and so reported. When I pulled the safe door open, something fell out upon the floor, but I paid no attention to it until afterward. As I locked the safe, I saw an old photograph of myself lying there, face up. Knowing then that it had fallen from the safe, and wondering for a moment how it could have gotten in there, as I could not remember placing it there, nor think of any motive for my so doing, as it is a horrid likeness and scarcely worth preserving, I just slipped it into my pocket and soon forgot all about it. Shortly after lunch, I was sitting in my room upstairs, thinking over the unusual event of the day, when Winnie came to the door and asked me if she might come in, as she wished to talk with me. Of course I assented, and, as she came in, looking so pale and miserable, my heart went out to her, and, seizing her hand, I drew her toward the sofa upon which I was sitting, and, after she was seated, asked her what I could do for her. "'Nothing at all, miss, I am afraid,' she said. "'But I thought that, before I was taken away from here, it was my duty to see you and tell you what is on my mind connected with those diamonds which have been the cause of so much trouble.' if you mean by what you say winnie that they will take you away from here on account of your having had anything to do with the loss of the jewels let me assure you that there is no danger of that at present at least as i will interfere to prevent any such injustice i replied i thank you miss for your very kind intentions toward me but you will be powerless i think to save me this disgrace when i tell you what i know of the doings of that officer who was here you will agree with me i cannot believe that it is as bad as you imagine winnie but go on with what you have to say and let's hear the worst of it i said trying to cheer her miss lindley you know i do not have much love for my brother i believe him capable of doing almost anything except honest labor which would put money in his pocket provided he can do it without much risk of the law he is none too good to steal but he is naturally a coward and would see that there was little chance of his being suspected before he would steal from any person who might cause his arrest and punishment the presence of the diamonds here may have been a great temptation to him and circumstances which i will mention later on made it appear quite easy for him to obtain them but miss i can assure you that he is innocent of this crime that although the officer has seen evidences which point to him as the thief i can swear if necessary of my own knowledge that he has never even seen the diamonds winnie was terribly in earnest by this time and i could plainly see he was telling me the truth you must know miss how the officer's visit here has resulted that he suspects the robbery to have been done by me and richard together and that richard carried the diamonds off you may not know that richard has been arrested and my mother's house searched for the jewels why they have not come to arrest me i cannot say but i am waiting in fear and trembling for their summons oh miss i cannot bear this disgrace and have come to you in my grief as i believe you to be truly my friend and though i have no faith that you can save me i have hopes of convincing you of my innocence it will require no effort for you to do that winnie as i have never for a moment doubted you i responded as i pressed her hand but what causes you to think that you are suspected by the officer i have heard very few of the particulars of his investigation after i left the room tell me what you know of them enough to convince me that from the first he suspected me although he treated me very politely the very nature of his questions showed me that i was right in my fears what grounds had he for these suspicions i asked strong ones i must admit miss and it was my knowledge of this that made me dread meeting him. Last night, when I went over home, I somehow dropped the key of the gate out of my pocket, and did not discover the loss until I arrived back here. As it was pretty late, I concluded not to go back for it then, but went around to the stable and got Dan to let me through that way. When Dan was questioned by the officer, he told of this as I suspected he might. 
the officer soon obtained all the particulars of my doings from me how i told mother of the beautiful diamonds which you remember you showed me and told her in richard's presence though i really believed him to be sleeping at the time and of my losing the gate key and coming in by the stable i then told him of richard's finding the key and bringing it here this morning which accounted for its being in its usual place i told him of richard quarrelling with me and of my hurrying him out of the back door under threat of calling your father this i did without being questioned as i suspected that dan might have heard us wrangling or have seen richard leaving the house in that case i was pretty positive that the detective knew all about it for dan though always very kind to me has no liking for richard he has several times driven him out of the stable as i learned from richard himself so you can see that circumstances warrant the officer in his suspicions although i did my best to help my case and to save richard too for i knew him to be innocent i think your father and mr hopkins believed something of my statements but i could plainly see that i had not convinced the detective shortly after he left the house i ran around to mother's to see richard and inform him of my suspicions and also to caution him to tell the truth when called upon i found him at home and frightened him considerably with my story i told him to remain there and await developments which he promised to do as i was coming away i saw two persons whom i suspected to be officers near the house and turning as i walked along saw them enter i have heard nothing further but am sure that they have arrested him and searched the house as i told you of course finding nothing of the jewelry there they will soon be here after me and the poor girl as she concluded looked the very picture of despair let them come i said bravely and they will not take you father has something to say about that i imagine and i will see that he allows no such outrage take heart winnie and believe me when i say that no further mortification nor disgrace shall come to you i almost wish i had never seen the diamonds for thus far they have produced nothing but trouble for us all but winnie would not be comforted seemed nervous and uneasy and i thought rather strangely of it because i considered that after my assurances she really had nothing to fear finally without looking at me she said in a low voice miss lindley there is something connected with those diamonds which you do not know and of which i had fully determined not to tell you but as i cannot see my way out of this trouble by any other course i have finally decided to do so besides it may be best that you should know it what can it possibly be winnie that you should allow it to worry you so i asked somewhat excited and moved by her strange words and actions something that though it will clear both my brother and myself of all suspicion at the same time will i fear be cause for grief to you and your father i cannot imagine of course to what you may refer but want you to tell me at once whatever it may be i will miss she replied but it is an unpleasant task for me when your father caught me this morning foolishly admiring the effect of the earrings and after giving me a terribly reproving glance gathered them up and went through your boudoir into his rooms i feeling terribly mortified immediately left your room here and rushed up the stairs on the way to my own room in going up i met your brother mr pierre upon the stairs and excited as i was had nearly run against him before i saw him i remained but a moment in my room returning downstairs to attend to my usual morning work which had been interrupted by my unpleasant experience between your father and the diamonds as i entered that door leading into these rooms i happened to glance into the mirror over your dressing-table there and saw reflected therein your brother standing in front of your father's bureau and trying to open one of the drawers as this action seemed peculiar i remained where i was and as i was out of his sight could watch him without fear of discovery when he found that the drawer was locked and the key removed he took a small bunch of keys from his pocket and after trying a number of them found one which answered his purpose and he soon had the drawer open taking from it a paper box which i recognize as the one containing the diamonds after removing the lid and looking into it he placed it in his breast pocket before closing the drawer he searched further for something which he seemed to want and presently drew out a large card upon which he rapidly wrote something with a pencil and passed out with the card in his hand in a few moments i heard him close and lock the door of the safe in the passage after which he immediately went downstairs 
I was so confused and excited over what I had witnessed that, instead of going about my work, I again went up to my room to calm myself, but had small chance of doing so before Richard came stealing in, and I had the unpleasant scene with him, which ended in my getting him out of the house just as you and your father came up from breakfast. A few minutes after this, I met you in the hall when you told me of the robbery, and also told me to remain, leaving everything upstairs untouched until after the investigation. As Winnie mentioned the card and the closing of the safe, the incident of my picking up the photograph flashed across my mind. As she finished her story, I quickly drew it from my pocket and saw that the back of it was nearly covered with pencil writing, and you may imagine my feelings when I read what you know to be Pierre's message to me. Hastily showing it to Winnie, I asked her if that looked like the card she saw in Pierre's hand, to which she replied that it seemed to be of the same size, which was the only way in which she could judge of it. She had not noticed that it was a photograph, but at the distance which she stood from him, and that distance apparently doubled by the reflection in the glass, she could hardly have distinguished it if it were such. I then explained to her something of the message, told her that what she had witnessed in the confirmatory tone of the message entirely cleared away any evidence of danger to her or her brother, and dismissed her as cheerfully as I could under the circumstances of this new shock. As soon as she had gone out, I rang for Jerry and told him to send Papa to me immediately. Mr. Lindley has gone downtown, miss, and said he would not be back before a couple of hours. As there was nothing else to do, I passed the time in brooding over this new turn to the mystery, and had managed to get myself worked up into a pretty state of excitement before Papa's return. When he came in, I went directly to him and, trying to control my own feelings, handed him the card and carefully watched him to see what effect it would have upon him. His face, which looked troubled enough when he commenced reading, showed signs of increased emotion as he proceeded, and as he finished, he looked up and said in a faltering sort of way, Well, Kate, this only confirms what I have feared, from something I have learned since I left here after luncheon. But you have not told me where you found this card. In as few words as possible, I then related what had transpired, how I found the card and carelessly put it away, and how Winnie's statement had been the means of establishing the importance of it. Seeing that he looked much troubled, I endeavored to rally him by suggesting that the whole thing was a joke of Pierre's, which would be explained when he came home. Yes, my dear, when he comes home, but when will that be, do you suppose? He replied sadly. Why, I said cheerfully, pretty soon now. He never fails to come home before dinner, you know, when he is in town, without sending us word of his detention. I know, Kate, but I have information which causes me to believe that we shall not have him to dine with us this evening, nor for many following ones, I fear. Seeing that he was endeavoring to keep something back, which was agitating him beyond control, and growing alarmed, I said nervously, Oh, what has happened to Pierre? Tell me, Papa, at once. I know it must be something dreadful, but please let me know it. Is he... No, my darling, I know what you would ask. He is not dead. Nor, seeing my look of anxious inquiry, which he correctly interpreted, that I know of, is he in any danger. He is, so far as I am aware, in his usual good health. But, Kate, if I could have had any choice in the matter... I should have preferred to know that he had died in innocence to having these proofs of his crimes accumulate before me as they have to-day. And poor Papa dropped his head, completely giving way to his grief and sobs, while great tears rolled down his cheeks. Though quite unnerved myself, my sympathy for his sufferings gave me renewed strength, and, trying to appear cheerful, throwing my arms around his neck and looking deep into his eyes, I said, Papa... It cannot be as bad as you seem to fear. Bear up and tell me what you have heard or seen. You know you always rely upon little Kate, as you still persist in calling me, to help you over difficulties. Come, out with it, and I will warrant you that it will relieve you. So pressed by me, he finally consented, and I soon learned the cause of his trouble. As he is waiting to advise with you about it, I will not repeat what he told me, but must confess, Fred, that after he had finished... I found slight grounds of comfort for either him or myself. You would better go up and see him, and if you desire to talk with me further, you will find me here on your return. I judged by Kate's words that she desired an interview with me after I had heard her father's statement, and so replied, All right, Kate, 
i shall want to see you again and putting out my hand which she grasped quite tenderly i left her end of section eight section nine of a flurry in diamonds by amos chiptree this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by tom penn chapter twelve on reaching mr lindley's rooms i found him sitting in a great easy chair his head resting upon his hand in a meditative sort of way as i came in he arose and greeted me in his usual courtly manner though a close inspection of his features showed me that kate had not exaggerated the effect which his troubles had produced upon him his face wore a stern expression unusual to him the corners of his mouth were drawn down and his eyes had lost some of their brightness as he spoke i could detect a slight tremor in his voice although he pitched it in a very low key it was plain to see that it was no ordinary excitement which had so affected a man of his powerful physique and iron nerve motioning me to a seat facing his he began speaking as soon as he had resumed his chair at first trying to assume an easy manner but soon succumbing to his feelings he grew considerably excited as he progressed i have sent for you fred as the nearest friend of pierre and also because you are a favorite of my own among his acquaintances there are no other persons whom i can recall outside of my family here to whom i should wish at present to confide what i feel it my duty to tell to you although i think there can be no explanations given which will change my view of the circumstances which i am about to relate your close intimacy with my son for so long a time may perhaps aid you in discovering motives for his actions of which i am ignorant it is hard fred for me to have to acknowledge at my time of life that the hopes and promises in the early life of a favored son have not been fulfilled that instead of being allowed to remain in assurance that this son would continue to justify my faith in him i must conclude so suddenly that he has betrayed my trust in him that instead of living in hope of his future high standing in his profession and among his fellow men i must come down to the acknowledgment of the hard fact that he is a defaulter a common thief and that the victim of his crimes is his father i see that you would have me modify the terms but what is the use soft names for such acts will not lessen their enormity and as i am a practical man fred and used to plain speaking i may as well put it to you just as i see it as i have sat here alone this evening pondering over the developments of the day and comparing my early struggles and hard knocks and dependence upon my own efforts for whatever success i should attain with the very opposite of this as exemplified in the life of my son i have been more than ever convinced of my mistake in being induced to give him a professional education in place of compelling him to make his way in the world upon his merits in some practical business as you know fred i have been most indulgent with him in money matters since he was a boy i have always had the fullest confidence in him seldom questioning him as to his expenditures satisfied that he had no bad habits or questionable companions i have put myself upon an equality with him and tried to encourage in him a feeling of independence told him that my purse was for the mutual benefit of myself and children to be used liberally in proper ways but with an eye to the fact that as my fortune was not that of a vanderbilt there was a necessity of our keeping within bounds never but once have i had to express disapproval of any action of his in a financial way from what i have learned downtown today i think that such disapproval which he has wrongly construed as a refusal on my part to assist him has led him to take the fatal steps which besides making a felon of him have caused him to fly from home and from friends whose confidence he has so shamefully betrayed i see you start again fred as though you think me too harsh but when you hear all you will be astonished as i am crushed at the evidence which compels me to believe my son a thief last evening pierre came to me in a confused sort of way and said that he feared he should need my assistance in a few days to the amount of some five thousand dollars as i could not imagine what use he could so suddenly have for so round a sum and noting his worried manner i expressed considerable surprise at his request and asked him what occasioned the demand 
he then told me that some three months ago he had endorsed a note for that amount to oblige a friend of his young clark walter clark i believe is his name it seems clark needed the money in his business and pending the settlement of a sale of some property in the interior of the state induced pierre to lend him his name assuring him that it was a mere form that he would have the money for the land long before the note came due and that pierre would never hear anything further from it it seems there is a hitch in the transfer that clark has not received the money and that the chances are strong of pierre being held for the amount of the note i felt annoyed at pierre and plainly told him so and that i did not see that it was my duty to pay the debts of his friends i further said that as he was worth nothing in his own name of course he had nothing to lose in this case but cautioned him of the danger of following up a custom of endorsing for his friends i did not flatly refuse his application but i think he got the impression that i would when the time came that was the view i wished him to take of it so that clark might stir himself and raise the money if he failed to do this and the note should be protested i intended to see pierre out of it without his being troubled i thought it a good time for both of the boys to take a lesson which might benefit them hereafter besides clark is good for the debt and i should lose nothing in the end before retiring i asked pierre if a certain company had paid him any money on my account within a day or two to which he replied in the negative i thought rather strangely of that as this money some ten thousand dollars is a quarterly installment of the royalty on my most important patent under which these people are the only manufacturers and they are usually very prompt in payment the money was due on the first of may and as it was the third of the month i had looked for pierre to bring it up for the past two days the payments are made at his office where all the papers pertaining to my business of that nature are kept pierre and his partner mr blakely continue to act as my attorneys in which capacity i have always employed the latter an old friend of mine as you know since i first had occasion for legal advice in my transactions when i was downtown this afternoon i dropped in at the city office of the company using my patent and after a general discussion of business affairs with the managers i said to them that if convenient i wished they would let me have the quarterly payment which was due as i knew of a profitable investment in which to place it the treasurer at once apologized for the delay by saying that he had been called away from town for a day or two but that upon his return this morning had himself taken a statement of the quarter's business and the money which it called for around to pierre's office he showed me pierre's receipt for the payment which amounted to something over eleven thousand dollars a very good quarterly business for all concerned of course this was a satisfactory explanation to me and i left feeling in very good humor after attending to some other little matters i arrived at pierre's office at about four o'clock and found mr blakely there after passing the usual compliments of the day i inquired for pierre there replied blakely i am glad you came in as i fear i might otherwise have forgotten the message which he had left for me to send up to you pierre has been suddenly called away on some private business and expects to be gone for some days he told me this in a hurried manner as he was preparing to leave when i returned from luncheon and requested me to send you word as he had no time to do so having to leave at once to catch the train he did not say which way he was going nor did i think to ask i thought it nothing remarkable as you know it is not unusual for him to go away on business connected with the firm still i could not conceive of any private business which he could have requiring his absence for so indefinite a time i told blakely i was glad i had called for besides relieving him of the necessity of sending me a message i could also relieve him of the responsibility of longer holding the money which had been paid in this morning on my account he looked up surprised and seemed in ignorance of what i was driving at what money do you refer to lindley he said i have no recollection of any being paid in for you for some time i then told him what i had learned before coming there well he replied if you saw pierre's receipt he must have received the money i suppose but i am positive it has not been paid in while i have been in the office it probably came in while i was at lunch and in his haste to get away pierre forgot to mention it to me if so it should be in the safe and he got up and searched for it but without success strange he said pierre must have carelessly stuffed it in his pocket and forgotten it those people always pay in greenbacks and although usually in notes of large denominations still 
it makes a bulky package to carry. And Blakely was right. It is their custom to pay in money instead of by check, a peculiarity with them which I never understood. As they are a solid concern, their checks are as good as gold. But, as they, for some reason of their own, seem to prefer making these payments in money, I have never questioned them as to their motive in so doing. I was considerably provoked as well as surprised over Pierre's apparent thoughtlessness, as he is usually most businesslike in all such matters. But, as there was nothing to do but to await his return for an explanation, I left the office and came immediately home. While riding up the street, I got thinking the matter over, and then, for the first, began to see that Pierre's actions denoted something more than mere carelessness in regard to the money. It was hard for me to bring myself to believe this, Fred, but the more I pondered over it and turned it in my mind, the more firmly I became convinced that my suspicions were correct. I tried in every way to put a better face upon it, then to convince myself that it was cruel in me to doubt the high sense of honor which had always manifested itself in my son, and wicked for me to admit the thought that he could, under any circumstances, be induced to betray the confidence in which I held him. But there were the strange facts of his sudden departure, without imparting any cause, therefore, either to his partner or myself, the mysterious disappearance of the money, which he had no reason to suppose I knew him to have received, and, finally, I recalled our conversation over his endorsement of young Clark's note, and, in some way, connected that with his actions. By the time I arrived here, I was pretty well mixed up in a state of doubt and fear, but when Kate showed me the card containing Pierre's message to her, which I suppose you have seen, and told me the particulars of her finding it, and what Winnie had witnessed, how could I doubt longer that Pierre was a thief? As he finished, he drew a deep sigh, and showed in his downcast eyes and quivering lips the effect which his belief in the guilt of his son had produced upon him. I pitied him from my heart, and, though I was almost crushed myself by his rehearsal, I still tried to rally him by assurances that it could not be so bad as he had pictured it, that, though I could not yet see entirely through all Pierre's actions, I was hopeful that we should have an explanation from him which would make everything clear without loss of honor on his part. But, as I really had nothing substantial to offer him to justify me in these views, I did not succeed in altering his conclusions. Seeing the hopelessness of future argument with him on the subject, I turned the conversation in other channels. Asking him about the dismissal of Sloan, he told me that he had no trouble in that direction, as the officer apparently expected such action on his part. He has no suspicion, I think, of the new turn of affairs, but imagines that when he has made some sort of a confession and restored the diamonds, that Kate has interceded for her and her brother and induced me to decline prosecuting them. This I gathered from his conversation and hints thrown out by him. I did not dispute the correctness of his conclusions, rather encouraging him to believe that he had guessed the truth, paid him a good round fee for his services, and instructed him to discharge Richard, as I should not appear against him. He left seemingly satisfied with his pay, and confident that he had accomplished a clever piece of detective work. Perhaps I did wrong in not telling him of my discoveries in retaining his services in the pursuit of my son. But Fred... I have not yet determined whether such pursuit is advisable, and therefore thought it best not to acquaint him with this new phase of the case. You did right, sir, I replied, for although Sloan and his chief will still think Winnie and her brother guilty, no harm can come to them, and at the proper time we can explain matters to the officials. This matter must right itself in some way before long. It is kind of you to say so, Fred, and I know that you feel the force of what you say, he said, rising and grasping my hand but for me can only see in the affair the damning disgrace into which Pierre, in his rashness, has led not only himself, but also his family. With regard to the diamonds, Fred, I will see that you are paid for them as soon as I can settle myself to attend to business. Don't mention that now, Mr. Lindley, I said. That is an after-consideration, and does not now interest me in the least. Neither father nor any of our people at the store know anything of the loss, and his father will not be in town for about ten days, I shall keep the matter to myself until his return. In the meantime, some satisfactory ending to the mystery may be arrived at, obviating any necessity for me to let him into the secret at all. So please do not let that part of the affair disturb you. 
Remembering my promise to see Kate before I left, and as it was getting late, I expressed a hope that, after sleeping on the matter, he would take a brighter view of the situation, and, bidding him good night, withdrew. Well, Kate, I began as soon as I rejoined her, I have heard your father's statement, and, while I must acknowledge that he has some grounds for his suspicions against Pierre, I do not see the justice or propriety of his condemning him so strongly without further evidence than he now has. I can see that, to a man of your father's fine feelings of honor, the least deviation from a strict course of rectitude on the part of an only son must be most humiliating, and he has my sympathy in his sorrow. But I cannot yet bring myself to believe that Pierre has done anything either criminal or dishonorable. Oh, Fred, she replied warmly, it does my soul good to hear you say that. I knew that you would not condemn Pierre without the strongest proofs of his dishonesty, that you would not allow yourself to be prejudiced against your own convictions of his strength of character, even by Papa, whose confidence in him seems so sadly shaken. For myself, I must admit that Papa's terrible earnestness in his belief has partly converted me to his views, but your words have reassured me, and, though I can give no reason for the feeling, I have a consciousness that we have wronged Pierre by our suspicions. I do not expect that you can offer any explanation for his strange actions, as, in the whirl of excitement through which we are passing, calm thinking would be out of the question for you as well as for myself. That's just it, Kate, I said. When we get our wits again, perhaps some solution of this mystery will suggest itself, which now, in our unsettled state of mind, is out of the question. I forgot to mention, Fred, said Kate, in quite a cheerful tone, that I received a letter from Grace Hartwell this afternoon, in which she writes that she is coming to the city with her uncle in a few days. Mr. Hartwell is called here upon business, which will occupy his time for several days, and Grace will make her headquarters here. I am to expect her on Saturday morning. I was glad on Kate's account to hear this pleasant news. This Miss Hartwell was a charming girl, whom the Lindleys had met some years previously on one of their summer jaunts, and in whose company, and that of the family of the uncle mentioned, they had traveled together, here and there, for a couple of months. The young ladies had formed a strong attachment for each other, and were in the habit of exchanging visits at each other's homes. Miss Hartwell was an only child and an orphan, worth half a million in her own right. She was the ward of her father's younger brother, a widower with two or three growing children, and resided in Boston at the home of this uncle. I had met her frequently when she was the guest of the Lindleys, and had assisted them in entertaining her, by relieving Pierre, in escorting his sister while he paid his devoirs to Miss Grace, upon numerous rides and drives, in visits to the opera and art galleries, and in attendance at an occasional little reception. I had for some time thought that there were signs of a feeling considerably stronger than that of friendship on the part of Pierre toward Miss Hartwell, which, with a little more encouragement on her side than I had yet noticed, I fancied might lead to an ultimate betrothal. I thought her the handsomest young woman I had ever met, some two years Kate's senior, tall and rather slightly built, though not at all thin. She was the very personification of ease and grace, either in motion or at rest. A well-shapen head and a neck, neither short nor slender, perfectly poised upon full sloping shoulders, with well-developed bust and arms of perfect shape, long tapering waist and an erect, graceful carriage, gave to her figure the air of a queen. She wore her masses of light golden hair loosely arranged, little fluffy locks of which seemed to have escaped and floated at will over her broad high forehead. Her full deep eyes of clearest blue were captivating in their brilliancy, and in conjunction with rather full cherry-colored lips, which, try as they might, could not conceal the rows of perfect teeth beneath, gave her an expression almost bewitching. Add to these charms a pink and white complexion, a clear and rippling voice, a hearty, whole-souled manner without ostentation or affectation, a strong intellect carefully cultured, and you have something of a picture of her as I knew her. That Pierre should have become enamored of her seemed to me only a natural consequence. Whether he would succeed in securing her affections, I had my doubts. Not that it would not be a desirable alliance on her part, for Pierre was a man whom any woman might be proud to claim as a husband but it seemed to me that Miss Grace, not unmindful of her charms and her fortune, knew that she was something of a prize in the matrimonial market, and, although not strictly a flirt, was a little given to coquetry. 
though seemingly so light-hearted and frank in disposition she was a woman of discernment and having been brought up to know of the worthless would-be husbands of handsome heiresses floating about in society evidently meant to keep clear of such excrescences in fact of any entanglement of a sentimental kind while as then she could get so much good out of life in her untrammeled condition i could see that she was pleased with pierre's attentions and had a high opinion of his merits and position but i did not see that she evinced in the many little ways so often apparent to close observers of these things any signs of exceptional interest in him but woman is sometimes hard to read and i might be far from right in my views when kate told me of her contemplated visit i was pleased for several reasons although three days must elapse before she would arrive the anticipation of her coming would keep kate in better spirits and give her something to think of besides her own and her father's troubles then if there should be no solution to pierre's strange actions before her arrival miss hartwell would be a desirable confidant and adviser to kate in her sorrow i congratulated kate upon the good news and spoke of the good results which i anticipated from the visit i have thought of that too fred she replied but i have also thought that grace will have anything like her usual good time in visiting us just now but you must help me in making her stay as pleasant as possible thank you kate a most agreeable task i assure you but i am afraid i shall not prove a satisfactory substitute for pierre kate's face saddened again at this reference to her absent brother that may be true fred though i think not in the sense you mean to convey grace likes pierre as a friend and as my brother beyond that i do not think she regards him differently than she does any other of her gentlemen friends yourself included all right kate i replied smiling at her way of putting it i'll take your word for it as you ought to know all about it but i had hoped you might have seen indications in that direction which i could not be supposed to know anything of but looking at my watch it is getting pretty late and you must feel the need of rest as i assure you i do myself if there is nothing further you may wish to say to me i will go promising to let you know immediately anything which i may learn in connection with pierre if agreeable to you i will drop in here occasionally to ascertain if you may have heard anything if you get anything which you may think is important for me to know send for me at once by telegraph or messenger promising to comply with this request and requesting me to step in whenever convenient she extended her hand which i took in mine and slightly pressed as i bade her good night i fancied i detected something of a responsive pressure on her part but as it might not mean anything except an impulsive expression of thanks for my sympathy in her behalf i did not take it much to heart and after reaching my rooms was soon soundly sleeping oblivious of that as well as of the other incidents of that day which had been so full of exciting events end of section nine Section 10 of A Flurry in Diamonds by Amos Chiptree. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tom Penn. Chapter 13. For the next two or three days, nothing of importance pertaining to the mystery occurred, and in the meantime, having recovered from my excitement over the affair, I had settled down to business as usual. In my leisure hours I carefully went over all the details of the case, striving to discover some clue upon which to establish a plausible theory which should confirm my belief in Pierre's innocence. In his message which he left for Kate, you will remember that he said, If Fred calls before you see or hear from me, you may show him this. Perhaps he will understand it better than you or father. But, as yet, I had been unable to comprehend his meaning his reference to my calling i thought applied to my promise to call or send for the diamonds and the following words implied that if i came in person he desired me to know that they were in his possession but how was i to understand his actions any better than his father or sister i turned the question over and over in my mind and could find no satisfactory answer to it the only idea which i could get was one that had at first impressed itself upon me but which i was obliged to dismiss at once this was that taking the jewels from their place of concealment as a joke upon his father he had intended to return them to me at the store but fearing that i might call for them before going down in the morning he had left instructions with kate for her to show me the card when i would at once understand his intentions but at the time kate showed me the card i had ample reasons to know that the diamonds had not been so returned 
although i had been away from the store during most of the day i knew that if pierre had left them there during my absence he would probably have left instructions with some person to mention the fact to me on my return i had received no such information as i certainly should have whether he so instructed the clerks or not in a matter of so much importance to the house as the possession of over seven thousand dollars worth of jewelry true i had not asked any questions of the clerks bearing upon the case as i wished to avoid the necessity of explaining matters but i knew well enough that none of them had received the diamonds nor knew anything of them to further confirm my belief in this respect i had from time to time very carefully but in an indifferent manner gone over our entire stock of diamond jewelry and none of the missing earrings were there neither did they appear among the sales recorded since i took them away nor upon any memorandum of goods in the possession of our outside salesman looking over father's desk i could find no record of them having been returned to him during my absence as i had thought possibly they might have been in fact i made every possible search for them or for some trace of them and was finally firmly convinced that they had never come into the store after i took them away no i did not understand pierre's message any better than kate or her father nor could i see through pierre's motive in taking them then there remained the other fact of his strange absence without accounting to his father for the money known to have been in his possession altogether i remained as much mystified as ever i had called at mr lindley's several times as promised but learned nothing new connected with the affair the old gentleman was still very bitter against pierre and as he had regained his composure after the excitement of his discoveries had settled down into a condition of morbidly brooding over his disappointments and disgrace kate in sympathy for her father's sufferings and in her own unsettled state produced by pierre's continued absence was showing the effects of this strain upon her though she was endeavoring to cheer her father with assurances of her perfect confidence in pierre and her belief that before long they would be convinced of his entire innocence i accepted an invitation to dine with them on saturday evening when i should meet miss hartwell there were to be no other guests as of course in their present uncertain state of mind the presence of such would be embarrassing i arrived at the house in good season and found miss hartwell looking at her best and in her usual good spirits kate seeming to reflect something of her friend's lively nature was like herself again and i could already see evidences of the good effect which grace's visit was having upon her i was very warmly greeted by both of them and no allusion was made to pierre or his absence by any of us either before going out to dinner or while at table the dinner itself was a fair example of kate's good taste in the selection of the viands and in the furnishings and arrangement of the table and of the skill of her veteran cook in the preparation of the savory dishes it passed off pleasantly enough although it was plain to me that upon the others as well as myself pierre's absence had a depressing effect we needed him in his place at the board to complete our little party we missed his witty and entertaining talk his lively rehearsals of the doings and sayings of the day and the amusing little passages at arms between him and miss hartwell which were wont to keep us all in good humor miss hartwell tried to make the best of the situation however and taking my cue from her together we succeeded in restoring even mr lindley to himself again for the time after dinner i was alone in the drawing-room for a short time with miss hartwell kate having left us to give some instructions about the house and mr lindley not having rejoined us yet as soon as kate had gone out miss hartwell came over where i was sitting and taking a seat near me said in a rather low voice mr hopkins i have been longing for hours for this chance to talk with you knowing well enough what was coming i said nothing in reply merely bowing my assent i cannot believe she continued very earnestly that like mr lindley you have lost your senses over this affair of pierre's or that like dear kate you are in such a confusion of doubts and hopes that you have failed to employ your reason to assist you in clearing up the mystery as they term it i have a high opinion of your practical good sense and cannot yet believe but that you must see that any suspicion against pierre's honesty is entirely groundless i thank you miss hartwell more for your compliments to my good sense as you call it than for your evident confidence in my ability to account for pierre's peculiar actions i may as well acknowledge to you at once that i am as much in the dark in this respect as either mr lindley or his daughter 
do you mean to tell me sir that in your long intimacy with pierre you have not learned him well enough to be able to account for his motives in anything he might do or at least to know that there must be reasons for any act of his which should preclude any thought of dishonor in the smallest degree as applied to him by jove i thought as i saw the effect of the deep feelings which were stirring her her flashing eyes and heaving bosom and noted the rising tone of her voice as she proceeded here is a champion for a man to have and here also is an indication of a deeper interest in her brother than kate has acknowledged or perhaps foreseen her friend to possess your firm confidence in pierre's integrity does you credit miss hartwell and to no one could it be more gratifying than to me his closest friend i replied but while i can assure you of my unbroken faith in him i must plead guilty to an utter ignorance of his motives in absenting himself at this time and to the perplexity in which i find myself when i try to account for the circumstances which immediately preceded his sudden departure i presume you to be acquainted with all the various incidents connected with this strange affair your words not only express your perfect faith in pierre but also lead me to think that you may be able to suggest some explanation of his actions which has not occurred to any of us here it is possible that with your help we may accomplish something in the way of clearing up the mystery i am ready and anxious to do anything in my power and shall be pleased to hear from you any suggestions you may have to make she hesitated a moment before she answered my faith in pierre is strong enough without requiring proofs of his honesty when he returns as i am confident he will before long we shall learn from him the reasons for his absence which we shall find to be not at all compromising to his honor and shall also have satisfactorily explained to us the mysterious disappearance of your diamonds and mr lindley's money but like the rest of you i am impatient of delay and disposed to find a way out of this perplexing jumble as soon as possible it is my first experience in this line and i don't know as i can be of any service to you but when i learn just what you have done in the way of investigation perhaps i may think of something which you may have overlooked and which may be worth following up as i had not done much towards investigating matters since the diamonds had been traced to pierre it did not take long for me to acquaint her with my doings while i was speaking kate came in and listened with interest to what i said although she learned nothing which i had not previously told her as i finished miss hartwell said reflectively then you are sure mr hopkins that the diamonds are not now nor have not been at your store since you took them away as sure as i well could be i replied i have taken every measure to assure myself of that fact jewelry of that kind is carefully guarded by us and a careful record kept of it yet i see no other construction to be put upon pierre's reference to you in his message than that he should return them to you or at least to the store she said that was your reading of it too i believe it certainly was i replied though at the time i read it i knew well enough that he had not so returned them what did pierre mean by saying that i should never see the diamonds again and by his reference to my having had my pick out of them asked kate turning to miss hartwell just nothing but nonsense my dear she replied to have a little fun at your expense if pierre had really started out to make a thief of himself he would never have left that message for you at all don't you see kate that if you had found the card at once or even had noticed the writing upon it when you did find it you would have had time enough to have caught your brother before he left his office as he had every reason to suppose that you would read the message within a short time after he left the house about as foolish a move as he could have made in starting on his new career would have been to leave that card behind him and then proceed leisurely about his business for the greater part of the day have you thought of this yourself mr hopkins i was obliged to confess that i had not and acknowledged that it was a good point in pierre's favor but as i never had proceeded in the case with any idea of his having taken the diamonds except in sport i had attached no importance to the message beyond its reference to myself if the police officer had seen the safe opened she continued it is my opinion that the mystery concerning the diamonds would have been dispelled very soon perhaps your father made a mistake kate in dismissing him as he did instead of informing him of winnie's statement and showing him pierre's message what is your opinion of it mr hopkins 
since getting more light on Pierre's actions. I cannot see that Sloane could have been of service to us, considering that he could not have learned of the new developments of the case until several hours after Pierre's departure, I replied. I think that Mr. Lindley's objection to have even Sloane know of the evidence against his son was justifiable and highly praiseworthy, considering the fact that he believed then, and is still confirmed in his belief, in Pierre's guilt. Well, I admit that it showed a nice sense of honor towards his son for him to decline to employ the officer to follow him up, although he believed him to have betrayed and robbed him. Differing with him very materially in opinion as to Pierre's guilt, I also think that perhaps he was mistaken in his supposed charity, and allowed his feelings to overcome his judgment when he dismissed the officer. In what way, Grace? You surely would not have had him put the officer on Pierre's track, and thus add another disgrace to this unfortunate affair and Kate looked horrified at the idea. I am not so sure, my dear, but that the proper thing to have done was to have run Pierre down with the police in a quiet way, and thus have reached the bottom of this affair at once, she replied confidently. For myself, I should be willing to risk any disgrace which would follow such a course. But judging from the poor figure that your detective cut in his investigations here, perhaps he could not have succeeded in finding Pierre. I don't know anything about such things, but it appears to me that if this Mr. Sloane is justly entitled to the reputation which you say he bears as a skilled detective, he would feel not a little chagrin if he should learn how differently this matter has resulted from what he predicted as the probable result of his efforts. If he should see, as I think I can, that the whole affair turned upon his neglect to have the safe opened in his presence, he would probably feel that the fee which he had received for his services was somewhat gratuitous. At all events, it appears to me that, in justice to Winnie, he should know of the change in events here, whether he is employed further or not. It might not be necessary to tell him anything about the missing money and Mr. Lindley's suspicions concerning that, although, as we do not share those suspicions, we could not object to his knowing everything that we do in the case. Mr. Lindley may decline taking such action, but I have hopes that possibly we might talk him over. I did not offer this as advice to you, but simply make the suggestion as something better, at least, than the inaction under which at present the case lies, and for the past four days has been allowed to rest. You may think it worth considering at any rate. There appeared much good sense in her ideas, and for myself I admitted the force of her remarks. I told her that it had been intended all along that, when the affair was satisfactorily settled, the police officials should be informed of the true facts, in justice to Winnie and her brother, that while I had no objections to again call Sloane into the case, I feared that we should meet with strong opposition from Mr. Lindley in that direction. Still, we might explain matters to him and possibly secure his assent to the plan. Kate did not interpose any further objections after hearing Miss Hartwell's sensible reasoning against her first opposition. I will agree to anything which promises to cast any light on this present gloom in which we are groping, she said. And really, Grace, I believe that, from your view of it, possibly the police may be of some service to us. I will send for Papa, and, perhaps, when he hears your suggestions, he will agree to the proposition." Mr. Lindley came in presently, in answer to her summons, and, after some general conversation, Kate opened the subject to him. To my surprise, he did not express any strong disapproval of the plan, and, after Miss Hartwell had repeated her views, as expressed to us, he turned to me, saying, Really, Fred, I don't see any objections to calling again upon your friend Sloan, excepting that it is hard for me to think of putting the hounds upon the track of my own son. It must be understood, however, that this pursuit is undertaken not to arrest and punish Pierre, but to induce him to return the stolen property and to come home again to ask the pardon of those whom he has so basely betrayed. Oh, Papa, interrupted Kate, say rather, as we do, that we seek him in perfect confidence of his innocence and of his ignorance of the distress which his absence is causing us, that he may hasten back to explain whatever we do not understand of this mysterious matter, and to receive our earnest apologies for ever having doubted his perfect honor. I wish I could, and with truth, my darling, but I cannot yet see any cause for changing my opinion, but rather, as the days roll by without seeing or hearing from him, 
i am more and more convinced of the correctness of my views regarding him it is creditable in you my dear that with all the evidence of his guilt before you you can still retain your faith in him but i pity you kate in anticipation of the disappointment you will experience when you know the whole truth as before long you must and mr lindley embracing her pressed his lips to her forehead papa she said as she returned his caresses it grieves me to hear you talk so i am sure you will find that you have wrongly accused pierre and that you will be the one most ready to acknowledge your error towards him when the proper time comes will he not grace i trust so kate replied miss hartwell and the last to believe that he ever could have harbored a thought against him when he realizes the misleading nature of his suspicions i am pleased grace remarked mr lindley that these expressions of your faith in my son in view of his continued absence under such compromising circumstances and if it were possible for anything short of positive knowledge of his innocence to relieve my mind of these awful suspicions against him your championship of him would go a great way with me it is noble of you and i am most grateful to you for it i wish that i could share your feelings of confidence that pierre will come out from under this cloud his character cleared and his honor unimpeached that i might have in anticipation the pleasure of congratulating him upon the possession of so devoted and enthusiastic a friend as yourself but grace i fear you are destined to a disappointment in your hopes of him i can see no break in the cloud it is all all dark to me it may be just at present mr lindley she replied but as the darkest hour is just before the dawn so in this case while we are yet groping around in apparent gloom we may anticipate the light which will surely come and dispel whatever doubts and fears we may have cheer up sir and try to believe that behind the cloud which you see the sun's still shining as to me it has never ceased to shine let us look at the facts in the case now that we are together and see if we may not clear away some of the mist which obscures it mr hopkins let me ask you as the friend and confidant of pierre if you ever knew him to do anything which might in the smallest degree be considered dishonorable whether in your long intimacy with him you can recall any act on his part which would be considered among gentlemen as crooked that may not be a nice word for me to use but it has the advantage of being comprehensive i think i may truly say miss hartwell i responded warmly that previous to this present complication of events i never saw nor heard of anything as connected with pierre which could in any way be construed as damaging to his well-known character for honesty and business integrity he has the reputation among his associates at the clubs and in society of being a moral high-toned man and one against whom no person would dare to whisper a suspicion with regard to his business dealings no man stands higher in the estimation of his fellows and he has always fully deserved their confidence he is in short a gentleman you certainly give him a good name mr hopkins now she continued can you imagine any cause which might arise for a gentleman of his standing with an ample allowance of means at his command for any ordinary uses with a fairly growing practice promising him future prominence in his profession and a probable fortune does any reason suggest itself to you i ask why a man in this enviable position should steal something less than twenty thousand dollars in money and diamonds belonging jointly to his father and his best friend abandon his home and profession and go out into the world with only the proceeds of his crime in exchange for the loss of his reputation his friends his prospective fortune and everything which would naturally tend to his happiness in life to wander about alone in disguise perhaps of name and person fearing constantly that he might meet some of his old acquaintances and if he should be obliged to shun them suspicions of strangers whom he imagines to be officers of the law in pursuit of him have i overdrawn the picture not at all miss hartwell i replied captivated by her enthusiasm as shown in her face which fairly glowed with excitement as she concluded and i thoroughly agree with you that no man in his right mind could be expected to take a step which promised so little in exchange for so much 
the only cause which would ever drive pierre into so ridiculous a position would be the losing of his wits and as we have every evidence that he was in possession of all his faculties up to the time of his going away why we must i think be convinced that your very graphic picture will not apply to him after a short interval she said another thing just here occurs to me is in some way connected with pierre's absence i refer to that affair of the note which pierre endorsed for his friend clark do you remember when that note will be payable mr lindley i do not he replied in fact i am not certain that pierre named the date but my inference from his statement concerning it was that it would come due in about ten days from that time which would bring it somewhere about the middle of the month he spoke to me about it on monday evening which was the third and ten days from that time would be the thirteenth let's see today is saturday the eighth and next thursday will be the thirteenth i'm not far out in my calculations i think as to the maturity of the note in which case it will be due some day in the latter part of next week you are acquainted with this mr clark i believe she resumed turning to me very well i answered although not as intimately as pierre who acts as attorney for him i think clark is a stockbroker doing a moderate business is a member of the same club as pierre and myself and so far as i know stands very well in business and social circles he is a very clever fellow and he and pierre have lately taken a mutual liking for each other which has developed into quite an intimacy between them he throws considerable business in pierre's way which fact i imagine accounts for the latter feeling some obligation to accommodate him by endorsing the note very likely said miss hartwell complacently and also quite commendable on pierre's part especially as he had no reason to doubt the statement of his friend concerning his ability to pay it do you know anything of mr clark's circumstances not especially although he is generally understood to be making money mr lindley can probably enlighten you some in that way young clark said mr lindley has lately come into considerable property from his father's estate although his affairs are still in an unsettled condition much of the property consists of uncleared lands and other real estate holdings prospectively valuable but not immediately available it was concerning the sale of some of these lands to which pierre referred in his conversation about the note a delay in the transfer of which was the cause of clark's embarrassment at the time have you seen this mr clark lately miss hartwell asked turning again to me not within a week or so as i remember i replied but that is nothing unusual perhaps as he does not come in my way excepting occasionally at the club i have spent very little time there during the past week and am quite sure that i have not met him in my visits but why do you ask i inquired as i could imagine no relation of her question to the subject in hand did it never occur to you that possibly this mr clark might be able to throw some light upon the cause of pierre's absence never until now miss hartwell i replied and even now i did not clearly see why he should be able to do so but your question has aroused within me a suspicion that mr clark might possibly in some way be of service to us i wonder i had not thought of this before and must credit you as shown in this as well as in several other instances with having a clearer head for this business than i can rightfully claim you must remember mr hopkins she responded amiably that i have only come into possession of the facts in this case after you and others have exhausted every theory which naturally suggested itself to you in explanation of the mystery surrounding the affair that i have the benefit of your labors in connection with those of the officer in following up whatever clues appeared and that consequently i have not participated in your excitement and disappointments therefore i see the necessity of beginning upon an entirely new course of inquiry and naturally suggest some points that in your previous efforts were overlooked as i doubtless should have neglected them as having no bearing upon the investigation at that time of their present value i cannot of course know any more than you but think that they are worth considering i believe it is decided that you are to call upon the police again for assistance although it was not settled how much you were to tell them suppose you decide that question among you and then you will be ready to submit matters to the officer as soon as you may choose to do so after a short discussion it was decided that for the present no mention was to be made to the police of the loss of the money and i was authorized to see sloan at his office on the next day which was sunday post him on the new turn of affairs and get him at work as soon as possible 
Before leaving, I learned that Mr. Lindley had had several interviews with Mr. Blakely, Pierre's partner, but had learned nothing from him as to Pierre's whereabouts, nor the cause of his absence, which seemed as perplexing to Mr. Blakely as to us. He was firm in his advocacy of Pierre's uprightness, however, and, though he had not succeeded in securing Mr. Lindley's approval of his views, had evidently confirmed his friendly regard for him in thus defending his son against his own determined condemnation of him. "'Blakely is like the rest of you,' he said doggedly. He makes his wish a father to his thoughts, and, without any justification, beyond his own blind confidence in Pierre for what he has been, he fails to see in his recent actions any cause for mistrust in him. Blakely is generally very clear-headed, but in this instance I fear he is not to be relied upon, shows more sentiment than logic, more the feeling of a woman, excuse me, Grace, and you too, Kate, for speaking so plainly, than that of a shrewd lawyer. And right royally, sir, has he earned our thanks for these proofs of his ability to sink the feelings of the lawyer into those of the man and to admit the possibility of any man rendering himself liable to a suspicion of wrongdoing by acts which may turn out to be only honorable and just. Mr. Lindley graciously permitted Miss Hartwell to have the last word, as I believe she would have if she had continued the argument all night. Not that he was at all changed in opinion by her words. It would plainly require something more material than words to do that. But he liked Miss Hartwell, and had since his first acquaintance with her, and think his regard for her was intensified by her warm defense of his son, even against his accusations. Kate was simply charmed by her words, and though she said very little, it showed in the approving expression of her face her great satisfaction at having so strong an ally. I thought at the time that, if Pierre was desirous of securing the affection of this noble woman, it would be better for him to prolong his absence a while, and let this enthusiastic feeling of confidence in, and regard for his honor, as shown by her, grow by what it fed upon, as felt a consciousness that, if undisturbed, it must develop into a more tender passion, and before long. I left the house, promising the young ladies to attend morning service at church with them, and in the afternoon to have an interview with Sloane, which under the circumstances I concluded would be a comprehensive, if not a strictly orthodox way of passing the Sabbath. End of section 10. Section 11 of A Flurry in Diamonds by Amos Chiptree. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tom Penn. Chapter 14. I found Sloane at his office when I called, and he appeared pleased, though not at all surprised, to see me. Well, Mr. Hopkins, I suppose that the return of your diamonds and the girl's explanation of matters connected with their temporary loss have quieted the excitement up at Mr. Lindley's, and everything is lovely, eh? Not exactly, Sloan, I replied. In the first place, the diamonds have not turned up, and, in the next, the girl's explanation has had a disquieting, rather than a soothing effect upon myself and friends. I don't understand you, sir, he said, startled by my words. You don't mean to tell me that the diamonds are still missing? That is precisely what I mean, I replied smiling in spite of myself at his embarrassment as he grasped the force of my words and that we are as much in the dark concerning them as ever sit down if you please sir he said in a low rapid tone as he quietly stepped to the door and closed it i complied and he drew a chair close up in front of me and seating himself he said quite anxiously you say that you have not recovered the jewelry and that the girl's explanation whatever it may have been has complicated affairs more than ever? Please explain yourself, sir, as I own up to being shocked at your statement. My professional reputation may be at stake in this matter. It has turned out quite differently from what you predicted it would, Sloan, I replied, rather enjoying his discomfiture, then relenting. Perhaps we made a mistake in not at once informing you of the new turn of affairs, instead of allowing you to think that you had succeeded in clearing up the mystery. But when you hear what I have to tell you, you will perceive the reason why it was thought better to allow you to retire with a false impression rather than to acquaint you with the facts as they stood, especially as, at that time, it was not thought necessary or advisable to further employ professional aid. But we have reconsidered the matter and have decided to call upon you again, confident that with the new evidence at hand 
you will be able to assist us and at the same time redeem the mistake into which you were led sloan had by this time recovered himself and also showed his appreciation of my regard for him in again entrusting the case to him in view of his signal failure in the first instance i then told him everything relating to the affair with which he was not already acquainted when i reached the part pertaining to kate's finding of the card in the safe i thought i saw him start a little after i had finished he sat for a minute or two reflecting over my statement before speaking then said the affair has indeed taken on a different look and one which makes it more puzzling to me just now than ever i am alone responsible for the present embarrassment of yourself and friends mr hopkins in what way i inquired by not attending to my business more cautiously it is the little apparently unimportant things connected with this and many similar cases which are really the hinges upon which they turn and it is the knowledge of this and a careful attention to the smallest details which often lead us to success oversight or neglect as in this case of some matter which to you might seem trivial may be the cause of much future trouble if i had required that safe to be opened in my presence the chances are strong that the card in falling would have attracted my attention and being examined would have furnished positive evidence as to the missing diamonds my services in this case would then have been at an end as nothing would have been required but to send down to young mr lindley's office for further information he did not leave until several hours after that time as you say therefore there was ample time for you to have cleared up matters before he left it was a serious neglect on my part and one which i very much regret as it not only misled me in my search for the supposed thief but has also been the cause of much unnecessary trouble and anxiety to yourself and friends i see still considerable difficulties in the way of getting at the facts in the case but am ready and willing to do anything in my power to aid you and to make amends for my great blunder he seemed deeply mortified and cast down over the affair and i tried to rally him by asserting our perfect confidence in him and my own belief that he was making too much of a very small matter small perhaps to you sir but to me whose whole reputation hangs on just such little slips as this it is a most important one however that is past now and the least said the sooner mended i shall try to make up for it in increased vigilance hereafter i judge from your words sloane i said to change the subject that you are of the same opinion as ourselves excepting only mr lindley that my friend pierre is innocent of any guilt in taking the diamonds entirely so sir he replied as all his actions go to prove to say nothing of the folly of supposing a young man in his position likely to throw himself away for a few diamonds how do his actions go to prove his innocence why by leaving that card with the message behind him while he was at his office in town for hours after he supposed it had been read and laughed over he replied confidently but when it was found and read it was neither laughed over nor understood i said so it appears but i do not believe he is responsible for that sloane replied in some way whatever little scheme he had in mind for his amusement miscarried and he left town in ignorance of the result probably if he gave it any thought at all he supposed that it had come out all right his father's belief in his guilt how do you account for that i asked it is rather strange i admit but mr lindley is a practical matter-of-fact man and i should say difficult to convince of the innocence even of his own son where the facts were so strong against him in my study of character i have sometimes noticed that parents will doubt their children's honesty without properly looking into the evidence in search of a motive for their acts it may be a doubt that is born of their fears as some people always take the gloomy side of any question but it seems quite unaccountable i have given you my opinion of mr pierre's actions as founded upon your knowledge of and belief in him any other cause for his acts must be found out from other sources what do you mean sloane i asked rather petulantly as i did not like his words which implied my want of knowledge of pierre's true character i mean just this sir he replied if your friend did not innocently take those diamonds and if his absence has anything to do with them which i doubt as you know there is some reason for his acts which you would never suspect but which can be discovered from some source perhaps his father's knowledge of some such reason is the cause of his bitterness towards him i do not say this is so mind you as i have every confidence so far in his innocence 
and shall proceed in that belief to try and discover his whereabouts failing in this it will be time enough to proceed on the other assumption he then asked me the name and location of our club and for the names of some of the members best acquainted with pierre for the address of walter clark and also for the location of pierre's office and the name of his partner these items he entered in his memorandum book and then stated that if he needed any further information from me he would call upon or send for me i suggested that the latter would be the better course as his presence at the store where he would probably be recognized might necessitate some explanations to our employees which just then i did not consider advisable he coincided with me in this view and so it was arranged that if he wanted me he should make an appointment with me at his office i added that he could probably find me during the evenings at mr lindley's house and later at my hotel if the case was urgent he said that he should probably drop in at mr lindley's himself sometime during the next day or evening as it might be necessary for him to see the girl winnie and have her explain some parts of her story more explicitly and there were other reasons perhaps which might call him there which did not then appear as to the girl he said her statement to her mistress confirms what you may remember i told you that at the time i was questioning her i saw that she was not telling everything she knew that there was something of importance held back by her another thing her story shows that miss lindley had left the safe door open as the girl says that she heard young mr lindley close and lock it this is of no consequence that i can see except that it shows a natural cautiousness on his part not to leave valuables exposed the open window though is still a mystery no one yet accounting for it it remains with me an important incident and one that i cannot explain in any way consistent with our theory as to the disappearance of the diamonds however it does not affect the case just now and perhaps at the proper time it may be satisfactorily explained there is more in this affair than i anticipated mr hopkins and unless young mr lindley suddenly returns and explains matters it may be some time before we are out of the woods i hope not sloane in the interest of all concerned but like the rest must trust to fate i suppose i will not detain you longer and besides i have an engagement to dine with some friends at the hotel and must be going good day i arrived at my rooms and after dressing found i had some time to spare before my dinner engagement which was simply to join a little family party at the regular dinner of the house i lighted a small cigar and again ran over in my mind all the incidents of the past week with a view of straightening out many bewildering ideas which had from time to time occurred to me and to try to formulate some theory upon which i could firmly stand and honestly believe as the truth in this strange affair but the more i thought over it and tried to fit the various parts of it together the more i was puzzled to make anything of it miss hartwell's theories had seemed new and reasonable as expounded by her and agreed thoroughly with the views of sloane but somehow when i came to quietly ponder over the affair it seemed as much mixed up as ever in my statement to sloane i had given him everything which had transpired in connection with the diamonds since he had been retired from the case and also told him of the affair of the note and of the various theories and suggestions advanced by the different parties especially those of miss hartwell to these latter sloane had appeared to attach the most importance and they coincided in every instance with his own views i fancied that when she met sloane she would excuse his previous blunders as she called them when she discovered him to be of her way of thinking with regard to pierre's actions at all events i thought something may come of it all and as these people seem quite clear-headed in the matter while i must own to being quite befogged at present i think i shall leave them to work it out without interference or suggestions from me i was getting a little tired of the thing and it was a pleasant relief when the time came to go down and join my friends and in the social table gossip to forget for an hour or two everything in any way associated with the affair End of section eleven section twelve of a flurry in diamonds by amos chiptree this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by tom penn chapter fifteen mr lindley dropped in at the store during the next forenoon on his way down to pierre's office to see his friend blakely kate had asked him to call and invite me to join them for an afternoon drive and return with them to dinner 
he said he was going to drive his new pair of browns and hoped i should find it agreeable and convenient to accept as he wanted my opinion of the horses thanking him for his confidence in my opinion in a matter where his own judgment was so reliable as it was in anything pertaining to the qualities of a horse i promised to be on hand at the appointed time as he was leaving i reminded him of the fact that sloane knew nothing of the missing money and as he might possibly visit mr blakely in his search for points concerning pierre i suggested that he mr lindley should explain matters to mr blakely otherwise he might innocently divulge the secret to sloane as he would naturally think the officer to be in possession of all the facts connected with pierre's absence i am glad you have mentioned it fred as i might not have thought of it what does sloane think of matters now that he sees how he was misled by the former evidence he was greatly surprised i can assure you but like all of us excepting only yourself sir he sees no cause of suspicion against pierre possibly not with the lights he has but if he knew all the facts he would probably see things more clearly but let him work it out if he can and then we shall know more about it than we do now i hope so sir i replied and that you may see how mistaken you have been in your suspicions so do i fred so do i and as fervently as you but i fear it is only hoping against hope he said as he went out we had a most enjoyable drive in a stylish english trap drawn by the perfectly matched seal brown horses mr lindley handled the reins at the start with miss hartwell upon the box seat beside him kate and myself occupying the back seat it was a perfect afternoon warm enough for the season with a deep blue sky broken here and there by light clouds which skimmed along before a fresh westerly breeze casting ever-changing shadows over the landscape the park was already getting on its summer attire which in the look of fresh verdure of tree and plant and lawn renders it at this season unexcelled as a beauty spot to admirers of nature improved by art the roads were smooth and clean and as we bowled along among the throng of handsome turnouts almost filling the drives constantly exchanging salutations with friends whom we passed or met i noted many admiring glances cast towards our veteran driver and his fair companion on the box while his beautiful horses attracted the attention of many of our acquaintances passing out of the park we rode on towards the riverside drive and the tomb of general grant after we had inspected the latter and enjoyed the magnificent view from the hill mr lindley before starting upon our return suggested exchanging seats with me i see no faults about the horses he said evidently highly pleased with them but perhaps by handling them fred you may discover something about them which i cannot see i was soon seated at the reins and turning the horses heads towards home we were soon under way at a rattling pace the pair were fully up to my expectations and as nice a driving team as i ever saw with plenty of style and action a rapid steady swinging gait and good bottom they were as kind as kittens and it seemed to me could be driven by a child with safety the old gentleman was much pleased at my encomiums over them the drive home was if anything pleasanter than that going out especially to me in my favorable position as like mr lindley i am a lover of horses so also is miss hartwell and a good horsewoman too as i discovered in some of her previous visits to the city when with pierre and kate we made up little driving and riding parties in pairs and covered all the good roads about town in buggies and saddles i gave miss hartwell the reins this afternoon but she resigned them to me again shortly as we neared the park not relishing the horsey look it might give her in so conspicuous a place in your light wagon behind one of your trotters she said to me and in a more retired place i just glory in driving but upon this box with this heavy team and in this crowd excuse me we arrived at home all in the best of humor refreshed by our outing and with vigorous appetites for dinner which was served as soon as we were ready for it mr lindley and myself lingered a while over our wine after the ladies had left the table and as we rejoined them in the parlor later kate laughingly addressed me and said she had something important to tell me she had discovered a clue to my diamonds i saw at once that she was joking but retaining a sober face asked her what she had found nothing that i have not known since saturday shortly after grace arrived and while she was showing me her many new things it's a way we girls have you know fred of exciting the envy of our friends among her jewelry was a pair of solitaire earrings which struck me as being very like a certain pair of yours which are missing i mentioned it to her 
and then continued and told her all about our excitement here. I had thought nothing more about her earrings till tonight, when I noticed that she was wearing them for the first time. Look at them, please, and tell me if they are not exactly like the pair over which I hesitated so long before deciding upon the pair I selected. If Miss Hartwell will allow me, I said, stooping towards her as she sat. With pleasure, sir, she replied archly though I must exact a promise from you that, if you agree with Kate as to the similarity of the jewels, you will not put your detective upon my track, for, really, since my arrival here I have not felt more secure of my own immunity from suspicion than of that of the other members of the household. You have my promise, miss, I replied, laughing, but I had scarcely spoken, as I took a hasty glance at the pendants, before I inwardly felt that, without employing a detective, I should like to know something as to how she came into possession of them. Getting a little nearer to her for a closer look at them, she deftly unhooked one of the earrings and passed it to me. After a careful examination of it, I returned it to her, and she replaced it in her ear. You look sober, Mr. Hopkins, she said. Do you also see so strong a likeness between my earrings and some of your missing ones? Decidedly, miss, I do, I replied reflectively. But it may be a mere coincidence. Thank you, sir, she said in assumed haughtiness. I did not know but that possibly I might be taken for an accomplice of Pierre, as I am found with part of the booty upon me, or at least something closely resembling it. Joking aside, Miss Hartwell, have you any objections to telling me how long you've had those earrings, and where they were purchased? None in the least, sir. I selected them myself on Thursday last at one of our leading Washington Street jewelry stores, blank in companies they were highly recommended by them as of first quality and of a new style of setting and they are all they claimed for them i said your answer proves just what i supposed might be the case but there is a mere accident in the resemblance i know the house of whom you purchased them very well they are themselves manufacturers of fine goods to some extent and their standing is high we occasionally sell them goods but not often of this class. They would not readily be duped into buying stolen jewelry. No, there is nothing in it to help us out, though at first glance I thought I saw a way by which your possession of these diamonds might put us upon the track of mine, and without loss to you. I am very sorry, then, that they have turned out not to belong to you instead of to me. A glance at her face was only necessary to render it plain that she meant what she said. But, she continued, in what way did you imagine that my diamonds might assist us in the hunt for yours? It is customary in our trade, Miss Hartwell, for leading houses to keep all of their new designs of jewelry to themselves until they are ready to offer them upon the market. Otherwise, their patterns would be copied by their less artistic competitors and hurriedly forced out among the dealers, thus forestalling the originators in the sale of them. Now, all of the earrings for which we are looking are of novel designs and styles of settings original with our house, and none of them had ever been offered for sale previous to my bringing them here for Kate to choose from. They had only that day arrived from the factory. Your earrings are apparently perfect duplicates of one pair of them in size, style, and value, and I am not surprised that Kate was impressed by the likeness. I had a hope that they might furnish us a clue towards finding the rest of the lot, but the name of the firm of whom you bought them and the date of purchase proves that my suspicions are unfounded. It is a mere coincidence, as I said before, an accidental production of one of our styles by a rival house. It is not the first instance, within my knowledge, of a simultaneous production of similar patterns of goods by two houses, although such cases are rare. You may continue to wear your very pretty earrings in confidence of your legitimate ownership of them. Mr. Lindley and Kate had shown much interest in my explanation, and, like Miss Hartwell and myself, were somewhat disappointed that nothing had come of this rather odd circumstance, which had at first seemed to promise us something of value. It only added another to the various incidents of the past few days, which had proven so misleading and, like them, was allowed to pass without further consideration. We dismissed the whole subject for the time, at Kate's suggestion, and passed an hour or so in discussing other topics interspersed with a song or two by Miss Hartwell, who has a fair voice, and was several by Kate, who has a much better one. We were enjoying ourselves in our old-time way, entirely oblivious of our past excitement, 
when jerry came in and announced that mr sloan was in the library and desired to see me i was provoked at being thus interrupted and having to return again to the old subject but as it must always be business before pleasure i excused myself to the ladies promising to soon get through with the officer and return end of section twelve Section 13 of A Flurry in Diamonds by Amos Chiptree. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tom Penn. Chapter 16. Sloan had been busy all day and the evening previous seeking information and had made some interesting discoveries. In the first place, he had visited several of the club members best acquainted with Pierre and Walter Clark and had obtained sufficient information concerning them to justify him in believing them both to be above suspicion either morally or financially he had worked this part of his program most ingeniously and left no impression upon these gentlemen that anything was amiss he got his information in an off-hand friendly way being introduced at the club as a friend of clark from out of town disappointed at not finding him there and so forth he had passed the whole evening at the club and was well pleased with the favorable result of his visit in the forenoon he called upon mr blakely with whom he was slightly acquainted and it was at his office where he got the first clue as to the cause of pierre's sudden absence which we had yet obtained he found mr blakely enthusiastic in pierre's favor and anxious to assist him in any way possible it will be remembered that mr blakely had been absent from the office for some time previous to pierre's departure and that the latter left hurriedly soon after his return merely telling mr blakely that he was called out of town on private business and requesting him to send word up to the house to that effect mr blakely consequently could not know the nature of the summons which pierre had received but it occurred to sloane that some of the clerks in the office might remember if any message had been delivered to him which had caused his sudden departure mr blakely questioned them all but none of them could recall any incident of the kind and sloane had about despaired of getting any knowledge on the point when a bright young lad called joe who proved to be an errand boy at the office happening to come in mr blakely without much hope of learning anything from him put the same question to him hesitating a moment to collect himself he replied that he did distinctly remember that mr lindley had received some sort of a message which was delivered by a messenger boy and he joe had signed for it in the messenger's book and carried it to mr lindley further than that he said that the latter immediately upon reading the message looked at his watch and began to make preparations to leave the office which he remembered he did as soon as mr blakely had returned from lunch he heard mr lindley tell his partner to send him joe up to his house on his way home to notify his folks of his going away mr blakely however did not send him probably because as mr lindley's father came in later in the afternoon he told him about it himself here was one point settled at least pierre did not run away according to any preconceived plan unless he had an accomplice or companion who either accompanied him on his journey or who met him somewhere by appointment all of which that message if it could be found would doubtless explain it would also demonstrate the truth or falsity of another view of the case participated in by both mr blakely and sloane namely that the message was an urgent call from pierre to meet someone at a distant point on pressing business in any case the possession of that message would serve them a good turn just then and they set about to hunt for it but with slight hopes of finding it sloane here gave me a graphic account of their search how they closed the doors leading out of pierre's private office and went over everything upon his desk and tables without discovering any trace of the message how finally mr blakely agreed with him that in a matter of such importance to them and probably also to pierre they would be justified in unlocking the drawers and searching among his private papers with the aid of one of a number of small skeleton keys which he had in his pocket sloane deftly opened the principal drawer of the desk and there right in front where it had been hastily thrown lay a telegram it was dated from a small town in the northern part of the state and read as follows may fourth eighteen eighty six pierre lindley number blank broadway new york take the three thirty train to-day and meet me at blank hotel here to-morrow morning all o okay, k i think clark this then was the message which had summoned pierre and in response to which he had left upon the mysterious journey so unaccountable to us upon reading the message it did not take long for mr blakely to decide upon his interpretation of its meaning 
and Sloane fully agreed with him. The land belonging to Clark, and over the sale of which the trouble had occurred, was probably situated somewhere in the vicinity of the town from which the message was sent, and at which he had appointed to meet Pierre. He had evidently preceded the latter in visiting the locality, with a view of clearing up the title by himself, if possible, and, failing to satisfactorily accomplish this without the assistance of a lawyer, had arranged with Pierre, before leaving, that he should join him as soon as possible after receiving a message to that effect. He had discovered a necessity for Pierre's professional services, had summoned him to meet him, and Pierre had gone at once as promised. If they had correctly interpreted the message, Sloane should be able to partly corroborate their views at Clark's office, where, naturally, some information should be obtained concerning his whereabouts for the past eight or ten days. As anticipated, upon inquiring of Clark's principal clerk, Sloane learned that Mr. Clark had been out of town since Saturday, the first of the month. He believed he was somewhere up in the Adirondack region, looking after the sale of some land. He was uncertain at the time he left just how long he might be away, but said he thought not over a week or so. The clerk added that he was looking for him to be back now every day. Going back to Mr. Blakely with his confirmatory news, and looking the case over from every point, they had about concluded between them that there was nothing more to be done at that time, as in the natural course of events, if they saw matters correctly, Pierre must soon return. Clark, in closing his message to Pierre, had indicated his confidence that they would be able to remove the flaws from the title to the property and conclude the transfer. They had evidently met with some delays, and Pierre was remaining with his friend to see the matter fully settled and the money for the land paid over. They were in a region of country where mail communication with the outside world was irregular and infrequent, and the telegraph had yet to come, which facts probably accounted for their having had from Pierre no explanation of his prolonged absence. According to the understanding of Mr. Lindley, Sr., Clark's note would be due within a few days, and they would expedite matters as much as possible in order to have the funds here to meet it. Mr. Blakely had thought it best for Sloan to report to me what they had learned and see if I had any suggestions to make with regard to further action. He had brought the telegram to show me, and, after reading it over and hearing his statement, I expressed my approval of all he had done and assured him that I fully endorsed the views of Mr. Blakely and himself, and that I believed we should soon be relieved of our anxiety by the return of Pierre, and an explanation from him which would clear up the mystery with no discredit to anyone. I requested Sloan to remain while I informed Mr. Lindley and the ladies of his interesting news, and consulted with them upon the question of letting the case rest without additional investigation. The girls were overjoyed at the new revelations, and even Mr. Lindley had to admit that Pierre's case did not look quite so bad. But I don't see any way of accounting for the loss of your diamonds, nor of my money yet, Fred, do you? And as he spoke, he showed that he was still shaken in his confidence in Pierre, and that nothing short of a satisfactory accounting for the absence of himself and the missing property, and the return of the latter intact, would reinstate his son in his affection and esteem. I admit, sir, I replied, that none of us is yet able to fathom the mystery surrounding the disappearance of the jewels and the money, but I have no fears but that Pierre, when he arrives, will unravel the perplexing snarl to our complete satisfaction. I will further predict, sir, that when what now seems so puzzling to us is made clear, no one will appear in a better light, as connected with the happenings of the past week, than Pierre himself, and that you, sir, will be the first to acknowledge it. May God grant you to be right in the first part of your prediction, Fred. Then you need have no fear, but that I will see the latter part of it fulfilled to the letter. Noble words, sir, and fervently spoken, said Miss Hartwell, trembling with emotion, while her great blue eyes filled up with tears as she twined her arms about his neck and kissed him. Then, without releasing him, her face close to his, and looking him full in the eyes, she continued, still hardly controlling her feelings. Those words sound sweeter to me, Mr. Lindley, than any I have ever heard you utter. In them spoke the true father of one whom I believe to be a worthy son, the father who, in the very intensity of love for that son, could not bear that evil should be even thought of him, yet by a strange combination of events was led in some unnatural way to condemn him, without giving him an opportunity to clear himself of suspicions which were always groundless to all but you, and which, in the light of our present knowledge, we see to have been also cruel, if not positively wicked. 
i always knew sir that your heart was in the right place and believed that when the proper time arrived your fatherly instinct would assert itself in opposition to the unnatural prejudice under which you have suffered for the past few days i join you in your prayer mr lindley as i am sure also do kate and mr hopkins with a confidence as our part that it will be granted to the full then we shall take pleasure in congratulating you upon your return to yourself and in blessing you as you fulfill your promise to make amends to your son for your temporary blindness the old gentleman was visibly affected by her words but rallied himself in a moment and kissing her as she withdrew replied it has been difficult for me grace to withstand the appeals so often made to me by kate in behalf of her brother but there have appeared to me strong evidences against him which i could not put aside there seems some warrant now for your faith in pierre and i acknowledge to a growing feeling of hope within me that perhaps you and the others here have been nearer the truth in your opinion than i have we are not out of the woods yet grace and these hopes may never be fulfilled but i shall take courage from your deep feeling of trust in my son which more than anything has served to assist me in bearing up against this trouble if pierre should come out of this affair unscathed he will owe you a debt of gratitude my dear which i fear he will never be able to repay but i can assure you that it shall be from no fault of mine if he does not make the attempt i imagine however that he has inherited enough of his father's perceptive qualities to be able to know when the wind is setting favorably for him without much prompting how is that fred and mr lindley fairly chuckled with delight as he noted miss hartwell's growing blushes and turned to me with a sly wink it was well put sir i replied smiling and i have hopes in that direction as well as yourself but as i see that miss hartwell appears quite surprised not to say ruffled at our assumptions perhaps we would better allow matters in that direction to take their own course miss hartwell had by this time recovered her equanimity and was looking terribly severe at me i quite agree with you fred said kate in sympathy with her friend it is not right to discuss such matters in the presence of the persons in interest or rather in the presence of but one of them it is quite embarrassing as it was not plain that kate had helped matters much by her sympathetic interference in behalf of her friend and as the subject was growing somewhat embarrassing all around we dismissed it with a hearty laugh i had quite forgotten sloane who all this time was waiting in the library for my return with whatever orders we might have for him referring to this fact i inquired what course it would be best to take and was answered by miss hartwell who expressed a desire to see the officer and suggested my calling him into the parlor and discussing the matter there i never met a real live detective you know and from what i have read of them in books have always imagined them to be quite different from ordinary people that they are able to see through a millstone if necessary and quite competent to draw out all the facts in any case however hidden by some inherent cleverness of which they possess a monopoly and which ordinary mortals cannot acquire i admit that my faith in their powers has been somewhat shaken by my knowledge of your experience in this case but all the same i should like to meet this mr sloane as just now he seems to be showing more shrewdness than i thought him capable of with no offence to you mr hopkins as there was some justification for her harsh criticism of sloane's ability we could only smile at her illusions and there being no impropriety in calling him in i went and summoned him we soon returned and sloane met with a very polite reception by both the ladies he appeared a little confused at first by his surroundings in the elegant drawing-room and somewhat diffident over the attentions he received but he soon recovered himself and joined in the conversation in his naturally easy way we were discussing the advisability of following up the clues obtained as to pierre's journey and of dispatching the officer upon the trail when suddenly we heard the street door close and the footsteps of some person in the hall mr lindley started with the evident purpose of discovering who the intruder might be but had scarcely left his chair before the footsteps ceased and there standing at one side of the drawn portiere curiously peering into the room stood pierre End of section thirteen